once again, welcome to everyone to our webinar. <clears throat> welcome to our webinar with uh, the world renowned British sociologist and political scientist, Professor Colin Crouch. Welcome, Professor. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, and it's a great honor for us to have you on this seminar. Uh, the lecture is held, held uh, at the invitation of the Director of uh, Vuzufa University, Professor Dr. Grigori Vazov. And uh, I will be the moderator of the event, and I am Associate Professor Rudostin Vazov, Vice Director of European Projects and Continuing Education at the University. Professor Colin Crouch is an English sociologist and political scientist. He coined at the post-democracy concept in the uh, year of 2000 in his book, Coping with Post-Democracy. Colin Crouch is currently emeritus professor at the University of Tricks Institute for Study of Scientists. Crunch, uh, Crunch, uh, Professor Crouch gained his BA in uh, London School of Economics and his doctorate at uh, Newfield College, Oxford. In, from uh, 1985 to 1994, he was a fellow of Trinity College, Oxford, and professor of socio sociology <laughs> at the University of Oxford. From 1995 to 2004, he was professor of sociology and uh, chair at the Department of Political Science at European University Institute in Florence. From 2005 until 2011, he was professor of uh, governance and public management at Warwick Business School. In 2005, he was elected for uh, uh, elected fellow of the British Academy. Since 2011, he has been Emeritus Professor at the International Centre for Governments and Public Management, Warwick Business School, University of Warwick. The debate over the nature, scope and effectiveness of democracy has been going on for almost 2,000 years and continues till today. I will allow myself to recall the famous thoughts of Jean-Jacques Rousseau for the book from his book on social contract of uh, 1762. The English people think they are free, but they are deeply mistaken. They are free only during parliamentary elections. As soon as their candidates are chosen, they became slave, they became nothing. Democracy seems to suffer from a chronic disease associated with both <coughs> both a crisis of legitimacy of democracy and a crisis of the effectiveness of democratic system. It is all these crises of democracy that have been creatively and academically conceived by our guest, Professor Colin Crouch. Fortunately, his ideas have been disseminated through his three books, who was published in Bulgaria since uh, 2012. Through them, he expressed the opinion that immediate political alternatives is between liberal democracy on one hand and egalitarian democracy on the other. And he does not hide his preferences for the later. His idea of uh, post democracy uh, democrat democracy is linked to a system in which politics is increasingly close to its own world, keeping in touch with society through manipulative technicus, technicus based on marketing research, public relations and advertising. In other words, demo democratic forms remain in place, but they are increasingly emptied of their content. In in addition to his reflection focus of the cha changing relationship, relationship between capitalism and democracy, uh, as he argues that a market economy needs an insecure workforce, while democracy brings security to people's lives. 
What will happen to post-democracy after the crisis is extremely interesting. And now I want to give the floor to Professor Colin Crouch. Uh, Professor, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor to be invited um, to talk to you all. I'm sorry it's not possible to come in person to Sofia. I, uh, I was able to do that for the Bulgarian translation of Post-Democracy, the first book. Um, I had a very pleasant stay in Bulgaria that time. And it's, it's sad we cannot meet each other now. Uh, well, I'm also sorry that I, I have to give the lecture in English, but I cannot speak Bulgarian. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can read some Bulgarian because I studied Russian at school, so I'm not completely uh, closed off from your language, but I could not possibly start to speak in it. Um, now, the, the, that little book I wrote almost 20 years ago now, uh, on post-democracy. It was a very short book, and it was not really on a subject that I usually wrote about at that time. I mainly wrote about economic sociology, about employment relations, about local economic development, things like that. But I was asked to write a little pamphlet originally, and I wrote this thing called Post-Democracy. And to my great surprise, it's been the most successful thing I've ever done. Uh, I've written about 20 books, but this one just completely beats all the others, which, which means I obviously was writing about something that interested more people than my usual books do. Uh, and it was translated into a lot of languages. Um, the new, but then I, after, tw uh, well, after 15 years, really, I thought it's time to update all this because so much had happened after uh, 2000. The, the financial crisis, various other issues had occurred. Uh, and so I thought it was time to write a new version. And that was published last year in English and Italian. And it, it, it's now been published in Bulgarian. And it will soon be next week published in German. So Bulgarian is one of the first languages this book is going to be in. It's pretty it's good. Now, when I wrote that post-democracy book, uh, I had in mind very much something that was happening very specifically in the, what I could call the old democracies, in countries in Western Europe, the United States, one or two other places, not many, which had had democracy consistently since at least the Second World War. Uh, and so I was not immediately thinking of the experience of Central and Eastern European countries. So one of the interesting things to do is to see if what I say has any relevance to your part of the world at all. Uh, and I think it does actually, uh, but I, and I'll try to explain that. Now, what, what did I mean by post-democracy? I meant a, a, a system of politics in which all the formal attributes of democracy continue. There are elections, free elections. There's argument, debate, governments can lose elections and fall, new governments can come. So the, on the, it looks as though there's a very healthy democracy going on. And at the time I was writing post-democracy, there was a lot of self-satisfaction about the state of democracy in the world. But it did seem to me that increasingly uh, there was a gap between the political world and ordinary people that, uh, as our chairman said, uh, politicians were increasingly relating to the population through media techniques and through marketing techniques. And they did not seem to come, they were, they were becoming detached from the societies. Uh, and elections could sometimes be very manipulative campaigns. Also, actually, uh, participation in elections was was and can, and is declining uh, in in very large parts of the so-called democratic world. So I thought that not everything was healthy with democracy, and, and I call it post-democracy because it's not like when you get a dictatorship and democracy is abolished. All the forms continued very healthily. It's just that the it's as though the life was being sucked out of the system. 
I did not say that we were in post-democracies in the Western world. Uh, there is too much life in civil society for that. And I pointed in particular to uh, the feminist movement, the environmentalist movement, and also the, uh, the, the, the xenophobic populist movements who were just beginning them, as evidence that society could still generate issues that gave a shock to the political system. So we, we were not there yet. We still were living in vibrant civil societies, but there was a danger. We were on a road towards post-democracy. Now, why was this happening? And I, there were two principal causes. Uh, and these are causes, no one is to blame for these things, right? This is not, a, 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 I'm not accusing anyone of causing post-democracy. It, it's beyond the control of, of uh, human beings. The first uh, major cause, which is very easy to understand, is globalization. That is, the economy becomes globalized, so decisions about major economic things happen at a level beyond the reach of individual nation states. Meanwhile, democracy uh, is, remains rooted at the nation state level. There's, there's an exception in, in Europe. The European Union is the only example in the world, really, of uh, a, a transnational form of governance that has democratic content. It's unique in that way. But in general, the level of economic decision making has come detached from political decisions. And that, that necessarily means that uh, democracy becomes weaker. The second uh, cause is not such a big theme as globalization, but it's perhaps more difficult to understand. And that is that in the old democracies, I call them the old democracies, the Western world's democracies, uh, the, the factors that enable people to feel connected to the political system have, becoming, have been becoming weaker. Uh, the history of West, certainly in particular Western European democracy, the history lies in past struggles over class and over religion. Um, in the United States, it's rather different. It was struggles around, uh, around slavery uh, and, and uh, relations between the North and the South. But these, these struggles in which individual citizens could somehow feel attached to politics because they had an identity of class or religion that linked them to these struggles. Now, all that happened a long while ago now um, uh, from at least the Second World War, in the Western world, we've had universal adult citizenship. So in theory, no one is, or very few people are excluded from democracy. And those identities that gave people, that, that affected people in struggles, gradually disappeared. They became memories of the experiences of grandparents, great-grandparents. Also, the, uh, the, 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 these great struggles uh, over class had been about, rooted in rural society and in industrial society. And increasingly now, we live in post-industrial societies. And most people have jobs in sectors that did not form part of those old struggles of the first part of the 20th century. So it doesn't mean that much to them. Also in Europe, and this is where Europe and the United States are very, very different. In Europe, we've seen a decline in religion. There's fewer people feel attached to a church, but more important, a decline in the traditional political position of the churches. Churches were historically very conservative. Today, they're not like that, certainly in Europe. So they, they, they have very complex political meanings. So. The, the, the historical factors that used to enable people to relate to the political system just become very, very weak. Uh, and it's very difficult for new identities to, to grow up. Uh, and uh, So if, if we take an example of Italy, Italy is the main country in the West where we had uh, in 19, 1992 a complete collapse of the party system and a construction of new parties out of that. These new parties have not been able to find uh, a, a strong relationship to the people. 
they're, they're standing outside the people that they keep collapsing and coming back uh, and so that it seems difficult in 21st century society to create strong political identities that enable very large numbers of people to feel who they are politically. Uh, so that, that also weakens the attachment of the people to democracy. In that context, and now this is then a third factor which begins to produce post-democracy and where you can start to criticize behavior. Uh, politicians increasingly became isolated from the population uh, relating to it in, in the same way that a corporation re relates to its customs. Uh, and as a result, politicians found that their, their main associations became with people in the business world, because people in the business world do know who they are. They do know what their interests are. Uh, they can cope with globalization. And so increasingly, politics and business got closer and closer together. Now, this has some advantages in that politics begins to understand business, but it also means that uh, there is an increasing relationship between political and economic power. Now, one of the part of the theory of democracy in capitalist societies is that there should be barriers between politics and business. That you, 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 you sh it should not be easy to use political power to, to to translate political power into economic power. And, it, and the other area should not be possible to translate economic power into political power. But as the democratic institutions become weaker, so exactly that happens. And so you find business people able to influence politics and get the policies and the contracts that they want out of government. That enables them to become even richer, which gives them even more political influence. And you get a spiral of uh, political and business power very closely linked uh, and uh, I saw that as one of the major steps towards a post-democracy. Now does any of this have any relevance for people in Central and Eastern Europe? And, and I think it does because and globalization is of course something that everyone shares. So if globalization presents problems for democracy then the whole world has this. Uh, now, what is different, of course, is the history of political party identities, uh, because under state socialism, there weren't political parties except for the one governing one. Uh, and it's interesting, if we look at what happened in the final years of the Soviet Union uh, and the, the collapse in 1990 and the emergence of democratic systems out of that, uh, there were struggles, clearly there were struggles. They, they, they had, struggle was suppressed for a very long time. Um, the only country that really had quite a long tradition of continued unrest until 1990 was Poland. Uh, but towards the end, in the late 1980s, in quite a few of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, you did get civic movements. Because uh, 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 actually Central and Eastern Europe is such a, a varied region. It's, there's far more diversity in Central and Eastern Europe than there is in Western Europe. But you, in several countries in that in your region, uh, one got these civic movements. It, 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 Czechoslovakia, as it then was, um, Poland, um, Hungary, and a few others. One got these movements towards the end, which looked as though they would become political parties. Uh, and in the very first years, in the 1990s, parties coming out of these struggles uh, were major forces in politics. They all collapsed, uh, partly because they, they divided, that they, they, they themselves contained different political wings, that once the task of establishing new systems was achieved, they started to have debates among themselves and in Poland and the Czech Republic. Czech Republic as it became, these then become rival parties. Uh, but also, because, but apart from those movements, there weren't many roots that people could have, that the, the, the identities that people could have in socialist society did not really enable them to link to politics in that way that had happened in the West through prolonged struggle within capitalist societies. So when one does find that parties that have 
come out of the old state socialist parties and became democratic, became social democratic parties, they, they are there in, in virtually nearly all the countries of Central and Eastern Europe uh, as recognizable political parties with which some people identify from because of people who felt not so bad about the old system, I suppose. Uh, also, in countries where um, the church, especially the Catholic Church, was strong, you get uh, parties based in, in, in Christian politics, in Hungary and Poland in particular. Uh, but elsewhere, not many parties have been able to establish a strong base. Parties are changing all the time. Parties are arriving and then collapsing. Uh, the most durable seem to be parties based around a very wealthy and powerful individual, um, uh, which of course is exactly that fusion of business and political power that I see as part of post-democracy. So very often a, a wealthy individual is able to gather some support, they've got money and wealth that can be used for politics, and they are often dominant characters. They, they, they usually they don't last for very long. So, in a way, the experience of the historical experience in Central Europe and Western Europe are very, very different. But actually, they're coming to a similar point. Um, and it's as though, in most parts of Central and Eastern Europe, it's as though it, it's already post democracy. Because that, 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 that second cause of post democracy, that it, difficulty of a population of feeling strong relationships to individual parties uh, that is more advanced in Central and Eastern Europe than it is in Western. Um, after 1990, many observers in the West assumed that somehow uh, in Central and Eastern Europe you would fall into a familiar Western pattern. Exactly the opposite has happened. And in fact, uh, the, the, the West would probably seize its future in the way politics is working uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And of course, in, in the very early years and after 1990, participation in elections was very, very high indeed in, in Central and Eastern Europe and or, in, almost everywhere. Uh, but it, it, it's now declining very rapidly, um, just as it is in the West and even more so. So I think the, 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 the post-democracy theory does uh, does affect Central and Eastern Europe. It's a different route that ends up rather similar destinations. Now, um, what, what does, what, so this is all, well, what I've been talking is part, partly what was in my first book, then I've been talking about how one adapts this for Central and Eastern Europe. But now, 18 years after, or 20 years after I wrote my first little book, what has happened? Have things continued? Have we continued on the path to post-democracy or have we come away from it? And there's a few relevant developments uh, that I think do mainly point in the direction of an intensification of the trends to post-democracy. First of all, uh, what I talked about as that sort of spiral of political and business power working together to exacerbate uh, inequalities, that I think has just continued uh, and has in fact intensified. Uh, and one of the consequences of that is the growing inequality that we have in most, though not all, countries. Um, and if I, here, of course, you need to do quite intensive research to find out what's happening. And I've only really studied in detail my own country, the United Kingdom, which I think is, it may well be a particularly strong case of where uh, close relations between business and politics are, are producing in a kind of corruption um, in that governments have favorite firms firms they develop particular links with individual corporations to whom they then give contracts um, with, with, with not much competition now for a few decades now we've been living in what's called a neoliberal economic system in which markets dominate 
Um, but what we have with these close relations between business and politics is not market relations. It's the opposite of the market. It's the suppression of the market in favor of close relations between individual corporations, uh, not business in general, but individual corporations and, and politicians. Uh, and we have had um, particular scandals in the last two years, well, the last year in Britain, with contracts for supplying uh, products related to the coronavirus, so protective equipment, uh, testing systems. Um, and we, because of the need to act very quickly, government has said, well, we cannot follow the normal rules of, of contracts. Uh, we're just going to give contracts to some of our friends. And so uh, firms with very close relations to individual politicians have had all the contracts and there's been no competition. And firms outside that group have complained, why don't we have a chance to, no, there's no time. We we'll just give it to our friends. And, and at the moment this week, there's particular scandal breaking out in this country about these relations between governments and civil servants on one side and business on the other. So I think, and I, British case, I don't know whether it's an extreme case, it's just I know about it. But it does seem that it, 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 when democracy starts to go to sleep and there is not a watchful eye on what's happening, relations between business and politics start to take a corrupt turn. Um, but the, the, the biggest example we've had of the consequences of relations between business and politics in a post-democratic system has not been so much about corruption, but about, well, there, there is some corruption, but it's not mainly a story of corruption. It's the story of the deregulation of the financial system that took place from the late 1980s onwards uh, in starting in the United States, spreading the United Kingdom, and then spreading everywhere else, where corporate representatives lobbied governments. In the United States, the corporate representatives became members of governments. They didn't need to lobby. They just they had the system in the United States called the revolving door, where people come from business into government, uh, have responsibility for the area that their bank is working in. They then come out of government and go back to their bank, and then they might go back in again. They go round and round. So it's not about lobbying government, it's about being the government. And one of the things that they worked very hard for in the United States, with the enormous influence of the banking system on politics, was to deregulate a whole series of financial transactions. A lot of precautionary rules that have been established in the 1930s, after the great economic collapse, the Wall Street crisis, 1929-31, a lot of rules put into place to, to, to impose caution and restraint on financial speculation. These rules were all abolished and gone away with. And not surprisingly, in 2008, the entire system collapsed and had to be rescued. So uh, there were too many financial people were able to influence government with voices saying be careful be cautious this could be dangerous these the voices were very few and they weren't listened to they weren't being carried by any political movements of any power and so we got the financial crisis nearly brought the world to ruin and then of course we'd become so dependent on banks and financial institutions that the priority in recovering from the financial crisis was to rescue the banks themselves and to compensate them for the problems that they had caused. Um, and this was a real example of the consequence of post-democratic politics, that uh, a particular sector of the economy was able to get that degree of influence and power. Uh, and even after what it had done was obvious, it had to be compensated and rescued at the to the cost of everybody else. Uh, especially poor people. Um, we saw that in very clearly also two years later in 2010 with the Euro crisis, when the priority of the European Commission and the European Bank was to save the banks. They had to be saved um, because everyone else depended on them. And as a result, poverty was imposed on large numbers of people, especially in Southern Europe. 
So to, to me, the financial crisis is the result of the, of the logic of post-democracy because the warning voices that a healthy democracy should have been sponsoring were not there. Um, so that seems to me that that, that that whole story of what's happened to the financial system, to the economy, is a part of the logic of post-democracy. Now, a further development that has happened since I wrote the book uh, has a much more, for me, much more uncomfortable implication for my argument. And that is the arrival of movements, uh, political movements, sometimes called populist, uh, sometimes called extreme right, sometimes called xenophobic. Uh, but the emergence of a series of mainly new movements, they're not all new, some of them are developments of old movements, but the emergence of new movements carrying themes, uh, partly complaining about the remoteness of politics, partly encouraging hostility towards foreigners, immigrants, other countries, um, partly carrying uh, socially conservative themes, um, about the role of women or about gay people. Uh, there's a cluster of issues there uh, that, that are not necessarily related, but they do. there's a kind of package out there. And in almost all, uh, not all, but almost all current democracies, there are either new parties carrying messages of this kind or old parties have turned themselves into parties carrying those messages. Now, at the first sight, the, the, what these people are saying, uh, call them populists at the moment, although I don't really like that term. What, what they are saying seems is very, very similar to my argument about post-democracy. They're saying there's an elite out there that has become detached from the people. Uh, we speak for the neglected and ignored people. Um, and I, I think one ha I do accept that the emergence of these movements does show that there still is liveliness in the political system. I mean, for me, democracy is lively when the pe movements emerging out of the public are able to give the system a shock, to raise issues the system did not want raised. And as I, I, I said in, back in post-democracy, I said there were three movements were doing this, or had been doing this. One was feminism, uh, one was environmentalism, and the third were these populist right movement, right, rightist movements. Now, are these movements then the answer to the post-democratic problem? They speak as though they are, um, but I don't think they are. Um, I accept they have a place in politics. Uh, I accept they, these are voices that have a right to be heard. But for me, there are three things about them um, that mean they are, they, they are actually in fact, in the chapter on this in my book, I call the cure that is worse than the disease. Because these movements claim to you, we are the cure for post-democracy. We will replace these remote elites with the real people. Uh, but I think it is actually worse than the disease because I think actually it has implications that most post-democracy worse and not better. Um, one reason is that the, there is... I said just now it was difficult to characterize these movements and to say what they were really, what, what, what they, they have a lot of different themes, but does anything unite these themes? And actually there, there is, it's something that I describe as pessimistic nostalgia. Now, nostalgia, as you know, is when you look back to the past and you say, oh, the past was good. We were happy then and now it's not so good. Uh, that's nostalgia, and, but nostalgia in itself is mainly a loving of the past. Uh, but I, I call this the new movements that, that are partly about that. That, that, that said, there was a time when life was better, right? Um, but they also they, they have what I call pessimism about them. In other words, they're saying, and now things are getting much worse. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a nostalgia that looks back with happiness on a past. It says, and now life's getting really bad. Uh, and the, light, the world is going to get worse. Um, 
And if you take that attitude, it's, it's in a private life you might take that attitude. But if a political movement takes that attitude, its consequence is, is this, to say, if things are getting difficult and bleak and problematic, we really therefore have to close down. We have to keep everything under control. We have to keep outsiders away. Uh, we have to restrict our relations with foreigners. We have to just concentrate on holding what we have. Um, and that leads to extremely negative attitudes uh, to other people, to progress, to change. Um, now, that in itself is not necessarily anti-democratic, but it does tend to lead to societies that seek closure and, and, and hiding away from the future. Secondly, this my second problem is a bigger problem for, on democratic grounds. And that is that if you look at the words of the leaders of nearly all of these movements, um, from, from, um, from Donald Trump to, to many of the European uh, populist leaders, they, they, they say, I, the leader, speak for the real people that i am the voice of the real people now that first this there's, there's two problems with that from a democratic point of view one there is a very strong message there that people who do not support the movement are not real people that, that, that you, you're, you're something unreal and if you're not a real person then you probably shouldn't have rights so there is an implicit threat to democracy there that, that we speak for the real people the other people are not real people uh, secondly, the leader is claiming to be the embodiment of the people. Right? I, the leader, speak to the people. Uh, they, the, uh, there are some exceptions here, but often these movements do not really have structures of members who influence the leader. There's usually a leader and a group around him or her. Uh, there are some women. Um, and they often don't have much of a party structure. It's not true of all of them, actually. but. Uh, but anyway, the leader always claims to embody the real people. Uh, that then also often leads, and there are many examples of this, often leads them to say, uh, since we are the voice of the real people, therefore other institutions should not get in our way. And so you will see uh, populist leaders will frequently complain uh, that judges and law courts are not democratic, therefore they have no right to criticize the, the leader. You get this very, comes across very strongly in Hungary, Poland, uh, and in Trump's United States. And we've had some of it in Britain too. Now, one of the things, it, it's a theme that I did not discuss in my first post-democracy book, and it was a major mistake of my part, I did not appreciate how democracy itself depends on some institutions that are outside of itself. That democracy cannot take full responsibility for the system because in the end democracy is about the actions of elected leaders and someone has to check the leaders and control the leaders. Uh, and the role of, of constitutions and of law courts is to impose restraint on what people can do with democratic legitimacy uh, because there's a danger that leaders will use democracy in order to actually conquer democracy and take power for themselves and we need that protection of institutions that are outside democracy but which safeguard it and guarantee it and populist leaders very often uh, threaten that, that, that framework and so I think uh, much about the behavior of uh, these movements and the message they carry, although it does represent a new voice in politics, it has to be recognized, it, uh, its implications are actually anti-democratic, not just post-democratic, but anti-democratic. Finally, and um, this is something very, very recent and which only applies to some of these movements, um, that they, the use of social media uh, has become almost a perfect example of what i mean by post-democracy this is something we, we've seen in in 
American politics recently. And we've also saw it in Britain in the referendum for the uh, membership of the European Union. That it's possible, uh, you need to be very, very wealthy indeed to do this, right? But if you're extremely wealthy, you can set up social media uh, um, message systems where individuals receive a mass of messages that look as though they are coming from very large numbers of different people who are all saying the same thing. And if you get these messages, you think, oh, all these people are believing this. But actually, there is one source that's generating these messages. Uh, this was very important in, I say, in Trump's campaign in 2016, very important in the Brexit referendum. Uh, it was financed by partly the Russian government and partly by American billionaires. Uh, and, and it's possible that, that, that if you see what's happening there, this is something that is actually centrally controlled, giving the impression of being very diffuse. And that's almost a, a perfect expression of what I mean by post democracy. It's a system that looks as though it's very rich and varied, but actually is manipulated. And so now, so now these movements, populist movements, may not be the only ones using these mechanisms. Uh, in the end, probably all parties will do it. Uh, but it's it's certainly. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry, my telephone. Um. So. We are further along the road to post-democracy, in my view. Um, what do what does, what saves us? And this was the argument I had in my first book, which I feel even more strongly about now. And that is, uh, it's no good saying someone ought to do something about this. Uh, it's no good saying governments should do something about it. Because governments are part in the problem. This is something that depends on us all. It, 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 what we, that term civil society describes civil society as, as society in general to the extent that it is organized and alert and conscious and talking about all these issues. That if a rich civil society can restrain post democracy, can throw up new movements and groups that challenge it. And uh, I said that back in, 20, in, in 1990, and I still think that's the case, that um, things are not as bad as they could be because we have, in several countries, strong civil societies. And if you have weak civil societies, the best thing you can do is try and strengthen them by forming groups, by campaigning. Uh, and, and here, social media, so the, the implications of, pol of social media for politics are very ambiguous. At one level, uh, it makes everything worse because we've learned that very large, powerful groups can control social media. And so they make social post-democracy worse. But it's still there as a, a mechanism that large numbers of groups can use. Uh, and and it, it's difficult to think of any campaigning group nowadays that does not make good use of social media. So social media are there. And it, I haven't yet talked about it, but I talked about the coronavirus pandemic and I was talking about corrupt contracts in Britain but in a way the pandemic may may help civil society something we, 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 I've certainly noticed in the countries I've been well I haven't been able to visit anywhere countries I've been observing closely and my own country I'm living in I've noticed that during the pandemic people have become more aware of each other They've become more aware of public issues. They've been more, more aware of their community and their links to it. People are alert and interested in what's going on. Um, and so I think that, that civil society will be strengthened by the pandemic. That, 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 uh, that, and so that, 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 that real, people's realization that we can organize ourselves to make the world better. Uh, we can organize ourselves and take an interest in public affairs because in the end uh, it's no good asking for someone outside of ourselves to come and help us uh, we all have to do it ourselves okay thank you very much so we can have some di dis discussion now can't we? thank you very much professor and uh, now we open the floor for questions and uh, discussion
I'm expecting the questions from the audience. Oh, is that so, through in the um, as a yeah. printed question? Yeah, where do, I, where do I find these? I found that one suddenly came, then it disappeared. Uh, in the uh, right corner, there is a chat. You see it? I haven't got chat. I've got present now. I've got turn on uh -huh. options. Oh, wait a minute. No, more options. Oh, I've found more options, I expect. No. Uh, I will read it for you. Yeah, because it came up and then it went away again. No, I have a question. Right next to the clock. Oh, what a... Sorry, I, yeah, I'm going to rely on the chair, I'm afraid, to, to tell me. The... Yeah, oh. if you're actually going to speak, that's all right. <laughs> okay. I was going to ask, uh, have you ever examined the role of higher education in the post-democracy situation? And what's the role of higher education? Well, that's a good question. It, it, obviously, it is true that, um, and I think there is a lot of evidence on this, uh, that the more education people have, the more knowledgeable they are about not just what they've studied, but about public affairs. Because well, if you have the capacity to be the capacity to learn, the capacity to take in knowledge and information, to think about it and to process it, and that's what that's what happens to us in education. If you can do that, then you are equipped to be a citizen. Uh, and so, in a way, as as the general level of education rises everywhere, which it is doing, then that, that ought to make stronger civil societies. Yeah. What was and that? Also, you mentioned the feminist movement together with the populist movement. So what is in common between these two? Because I, uh, from what I've read, I thought that they're from the opposite side. So that's why, but you mentioned them and you put them together. So. Yes, I, I only put them together as examples of uh, with environmentalism as well, green movement. Yeah, environmental. movements that have been able to shock the system. The, 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 because if you're talking about democracy, uh, you are looking at expressions of views and values that are conflicting and have a wide range, and you you you. You, you cannot only look at things you like, you have to look at things you don't like. Uh, you, so that, uh, and so you, you look at right across the range. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the only way in which they're being. Yes, I mean, uh, in feminism and the populist movements are usually quite antagonistic to each other. I mean, it, it's a bit different when you get female leaders of the populist movements and Marine Le Pen. In France, for example, is a very strong woman, and, and obviously is a supporter of women's causes. But it, it, there's usually a kind of masculism about around the populist movement. Certainly, with, with Trump, there was, and with Orbán in Hungary. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now to read the the questions from the question from the chat. Uh, it's coming from uh, Lubomir D, probably Dimitrov. Uh, do you think that the modern society is uh, immature enough to allow well, informant in order to replace corporate politics with direct democracy? This option used to provide hope for a better future of, huma of humanity. However, fake news and crazy conspiracy theories seems to affect both educated and educated people. Yes, actually, they don't affect educated people quite as much. Uh, but this, the question really there is about direct democracy, which in a way, Chair, Mr. Chairman, you started off by talking about uh, when you mentioned Rousseau, as he believed in the general assembly of everybody. Uh, direct, direct democracy is because only possible at very local levels. Um, you, you can't really run anything as big as a city with direct democracy. You certainly can't run a whole country with direct democracy. But uh, the experience of direct democracy can be very important for, make, for enabling people to participate in civil society. So for, uh, direct democracy in the sense of perhaps participation in, in workplace democracy of the kind that they have in Germany and to some extent used to have in Yugoslavia, where workers have a right to participate in, in decision-making. 
uh, the, the role that students can have in decision making in universities, which has become quite um, ability to have very low in local very local areas to have direct participation or local referendums. Um, there are ways in which we can have direct democracy at local levels that enables us to be members of civil society, to see ourselves as people who participate actively, and that can then help build movements that they become less direct, but they then still feed into, into bigger level politics. So I think that is true and important. There's also something else that has been experimented with in some countries, um, things called citizens' juries. And this is, you, sometimes governments have used these in a formal way. You, you, you select a group of people randomly uh, and they are they meet together over a, a, a period of time um, and they receive information very good quality information on all sides of a particular issue and they debate it and discuss it over and over again and at the end of that they try to come to some joint conclusions and then governments can use that to feed into their own decisions. Um, now that, it, just a few experiments of that, but it, it, it's, um, it, it, it works in a similar way to, that we use, in some countries, we use juries in criminal trials where decisions are made not by a judge, but by a group of citizens brought together. They hear all the information presented in a very fair and balanced way. They then go off and discuss and make their decision. Now, you can't, you, you can't really govern a country like that, but you, governments can use that mechanism in order to receive input from the citizens, because citizens are then not just swayed by what mass media are telling them, they have serious discussions, and people of all educational levels can take part. Um, and I mean, we had, we've had very few examples of it in Britain, but we did have one interesting one, um, and that there were similar things in some other countries about genetically modified food. Uh, and the government set up uh, a series of these things, uh, of discussion forums in different parts of the country. And it came back with very, very negative conclusions. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we banned genetically modified food. Uh, so the, the, but one can imagine a whole range of issues where governments could use it's a kind of direct democracy. It doesn't have decision-making power, but it can present very powerful arguments that governments feel, and yes, we've got to listen to this. Uh, thank you. And now I see a several raised hands. I first want to give the floor to uh, Maria Christova. He first, she first raised the hand. So Maria, please. Maria, can you hear us? Probably well, we needs to have a microphone. Uh, probably, yes. Yeah. Uh, then uh, I want to give to the floor to Dimitar. Dimitar, I see that you Thank have you. a question. Thank you so much. Uh, we can I appreciate the approval. Uh, Sorry that I'm uh, can you, hurting you. Yeah, there is a problem with the uh, with the sound. Can you repeat what you say? Okay, I I appreciate uh, the wisdom that uh, Professor Crouch uh, shared with us, and uh, I just uh, have one comment and uh, one uh, question. Uh, my comment uh, is regarding the direct democracy, uh, like the previous uh, question. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how would you interpret um, the approach to direct uh, democracy uh, developed by Professor Eleanor Ostrom, this uh, economist, uh, Nobel laureate uh, from the United States, uh, who developed the theory of the commons in this uh, approach to democracy like uh, uh, small scale, but that could be, of course, Scaled, scaled up to, to bigger, uh, to bigger um, 
to be governed is to be governed. I think that the approach uh, by Eleanor Ostrom is and I was curious to understand your position, dear professor, about the future of uh, democracy. Uh, I would uh, give two opposite directions uh, of development of our post-democracy. First of it is uh, described by the... Uh, yeah, it's Okay. Can you hear me? Something something got it interrupted. Yeah, it got interrupted. Yes. Uh, so my question is uh, about uh, two two directions that uh, post democracy could uh, could take. One is the this, those described by uh, Aldous Huxley, and the other is those described by uh, George Orwell. Do you think that it will be a society of pressure or society of uh, affluence? I am very curious to understand your <laughs> point of view. Well, I, I can answer your first question about Eleanor Ostrom. Yes, those arguments about the commons that you developed um, were brilliant, uh, and they, it does it, it, it does link in with the other debates about post about um, about direct democracy. And what's particularly interesting with her work is that often when people talk about the commons. They say, well, any everything that something that is held in common uh, usually is held by nobody, and it becomes neglected. Right? So, if if there is a field that twenty different people own, there's a danger that that no one looks after that field because everybody has it. Um, and what she showed is that usually when there are commons, there are actually people who do have a, a, either a direct or indirect interest in, in what happens to it. it. It doesn't become neglected. There's a whole series of ways in which people uh, acquire responsibilities. Uh, and I think that, uh, which is a much deeper view of what happens in the absence of ownership um, that then most economic theory has. So I think she made a major contribution there in showing the, the different ways in which we can acquire interests without ownership. Well, the second it is, I, I, I just don't know. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, because my book in a way is a dystopia. I mean, a dystopia is a, something that presents a picture of the world getting worse. And usually when people write dystopias, they're actually writing warnings. They're saying, look, be careful. Um, because this is what's happening, and if you don't like it, do something about it. And so, a, a, a successful writer of dystopia should be should find his predictions do not come true because people listen. Um, it's interesting. Or Orwell's main dystopia was 1984. Um, he was writing it in 1948, and he was imagining that by 1984, um, he, he did that just by reversing. He was writing in 48, so he reversed it to make it 8 4 instead of 4 8. And he said, Well, by then the world would be dreadful in various ways. Now, 1984 is long ago now. <laughs> we all remember it. Um, and it, nothing happened. Uh, so you have to be very careful with dystopias. They don't usually work out that bad, partly because perhaps people listen to you. Uh, you are, Radostan, you are also mute. You, you muted. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. <laughs> it uh, stays uh, unmuted. <laughs> uh, I want to give uh, now the floor to Krasimir Tudorov, uh, Associate Professor Krasimir Tudorov. He raised the hand, so I suppose. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bozo. Uh, Professor Kraus, very interesting lecture, and uh, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that in the extraordinary situation like the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, post-democratic uh, environment doesn't work so so well in terms of those contracts uh, and those things. Allow me to bring you back nearly 100 years ago during the First World War and the second one. Uh, based on the books of uh, Winston Churchill for the First World War and uh, Benjamin and um, Henry Kissinger for the second one, 
democracy societies compared to autocratic regimes with uh, for the second war uh, with stalin and with uh, uh, um, hitler as well democracy environments they had disadvantage compared with sorry again uh, sorry yeah, uh, Democracy, yeah, democracy, <laughs> democracy regimes, they had uh, relatively disadvantage because all their actions had to be approved by national parliaments. Compared with autocratic regimes like uh, Hitler and Stalin, they, they had uh, to do their own. Obviously, that in the extraordinary situation, uh, democracy environment doesn't work well as well. So in terms of autocratic democracy and post-democracy environment how you would comment it in terms of their sustainability yes um sure. it's certainly there are certain times especially wartime when government needs complete secrecy um obviously because otherwise the enemy discovers your plans uh outside of that context though secrecy and uh, an ability of government to act without any constraint usually leads them into making terrible mistakes because there is very little that can check uh, the actions of government um, and this and it's, it's interesting if we compare Stalin and Hitler um, Stalin it seems during the war was willing to listen to what his generals told him and it, certainly around the thing like the battle of stalingrad was able to make wiser decisions because people did his generals did not fear saying you might be wrong it was only a few people could do this whereas for hitler no one could do that he was always right and he would not he could not listen to anyone else and then you know in the end he failed um, and Stalin was successful. But I think, but in general, secrecy is necessary sometimes, but in general, secrecy means uh, no chance to look at an alternative opinion, no chance to, to, to see I might be wrong, perhaps if I do something different, I might be right. So usually governments that act in secrecy or where people around the leaders fear to contradict them, they usually end up making terrible mistakes. Openness means, see, it, none of us are right all of the time. No theory is right all of the time. The best we can do is to have the chance to look at alternatives and to choose among alternatives. And you can only do that if you have open debate. I mean, it's it's one of it, it's similar to the argument in favour of the market in the economy. That you, you, the market generates alternatives and choices. Uh, if you only have one thing and one possibility, it might be wrong and it might not change. Hmm. So you suggest to have constant prototyping from the democracy? Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, obviously hmm. decisions have to be made, right? At a certain point, you have to say stop, right? We make a decision. Uh, but you, the debate, like if we take an example um, about, uh, take a, a rather technical, example of this, uh, not very political decision making where to build a new road now you can often have debate enormous debate about the best place to put a road uh, and at some point a decision has to be made now if that's the line of the road right? but the, now but there are two things uh, that doesn't stop the debate about future roads in other places they will still go on but also something about any decision um, it's very rare that one decision is 100% correct. Uh, usually, if you decide we're going to do this, there are also reasons why you should do that. That may be that 60% in favor of this, 40% in favor of that. You have to follow the 60%, but you still get the negative consequences of the 40%. And so all decisions will have some even when they're the right decision there will be aspects of them that are wrong and you need systems that enable you to do something about that neglected part so this mm. is part of the human condition that we are not full of wisdom uh 
Thank you for that answer. And now we have a question from the chat. What do you think? Uh, it's come from uh, Vasilena Borisova. What do you think uh, will happen to UK politics and businesses during the Brexit? And what do you think will change? Uh, well, obviously, our economy will suffer. Um, you cannot make trade with your nearest partners. Uh, which you, our trade with Europe is about 45% of our total trade. Uh, and you cannot make... In, what we've done in Brexit is to impose barriers. I mean, most trade deals are about reducing barriers between partners. Out this deal is about increasing barriers, about making things more difficult to do. Uh, so that has to have a negative effect. At the moment, the negative effect is going one way only. The negative effect is on our exports to Europe. Um, because the government, but, but there is no negative effect on imports from Europe into Britain. Because the government is terrified that if it imposes the rules that it will need to impose now, uh, under Brexit, we will have sh food, major food shortages and shortages of other things. So the present position is we are hurting our f f British firms who want to export, but we are not hurting European firms that want to export to us. Uh, and that is the compromise the government has. Obviously, it cannot last that. Um, and so gradually the negative effects of Brexit must come. Now, the argument in favour of Brexit is that Britain will want to build a new set of relationships. It doesn't want relations with its neighbours. It wants to be a country that mainly operates in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean and the countries around those oceans. So, uh, um, in other words, it, it's an argument that says geography no longer matters and Britain can be a Pacific nation, even though it is not in the Pacific. And it wants to encourage British firms to make their business links with, uh, with, with, with those countries. Uh, and now, even if this is successful, it will take a long time to achieve. The government itself says at least 10 years. Uh, so we come, we face ten at least ten years of things just being worse for us. Um, the political implications of it are are difficult to see uh, because one thing that has happened with with Brexit is that, well, I I was saying in my main argument this morning that people's political attachments are becoming weaker, their attachments to parties. Well, during the referendum campaign and after it, we all developed very strong attachments to one side or the other. You were either for remaining in Europe or for leaving Europe. And it seems, that the evidence all suggests that that identity for or against Europe has become more important to people than the, a party identity. Uh, so um, I feel this myself actually. Uh, that, that I define as a European now more than anything else. Uh, now, so in a way, it, it's having it's had a profound effect on our political identities, but it's not clear that anything can happen as a result of that, because Brexit has taken place. It would be impossible to argue as a political party we should now immediately reverse that and try to go back in. I mean, that, that it, it's just not practical to do that. So in a way, the debate is over, but people are still feeling that they identify with one side of that debate or the other, which leads, leads to a very, very complex politics. Uh, there is a rise again. Sorry. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> uh, now I see that uh, there is a rise came from our uh, hand from uh, Matthew. Matthew, you have the floor for your question. Or comments, probably. Uh, till the match is getting prepared, I will continue with uh, a questions that are coming from uh, our chat. It comes from Theodor Yonchev. Uh, what is and what will be the influence of cryptocurrencies into democracy, economics, and banking worldwide? It's a 
questions about the <laughs> big question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I've just one cannot study everything, and I've decided cryptocurrencies are something that I will not take any interest in. I don't. Mm. Buy them. Uh, I, I wish they'd go away. But I'm, I just do not feel at all competent to answer that question. Mm. I think no one can answer that question <laughs> now. <laughs> at least some people know something about it. I don't even know anything about it. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, the next question is coming from uh, Desi. Uh, he starts it like that. Uh, Hello, Professor Crouch. Regarding to your book, will the big economy prevail? What do you think about the place of big economy in post-democracy? I know it is not a problem in Bulgaria right now, but in UK it is. Last month, uh, Deliveroo IPOs in the city were not very successful. Thanks, Desi. Right now, th yeah, this is quite complex, and I may need to explain something of what, what this is about. And the gig economy, you probably know that phrase. Um, it refers to workers who, though they work for particular companies, they are treated as though they were self employed. They do not have the rights of an employee. Um, the argument is that, that they can work for several firms if they like, uh, so that, that no employer has responsibility for them. And the, the, uh, the, deli I don't know if you have things like Deliveroo in Bulgaria. These, there's a series of these firms now. Where they employ mainly young people to deliver food from restaurants to people's houses. And you see them riding around on bicycles with great big sacks on their back. Now, they, uh, they're earning money, but they have no rights. So, for example, if they fall off their bike because the, the load is too heavy, there is no compensation for them. They're just told, right, you, you, you've fallen off the bike, you've hurt, your, you've broken your leg, so you can't work anymore, go away. They, they have no compensation, the firm's not responsible for them, because the firm says, we don't employ them. We just provide a platform on the internet whereby they are able to go to restaurants and pick up food and take it to customers. And it, it's become uh, an issue in quite a few countries now. Uh, the, the, the absence of rights of these these young workers, and in Britain, um, the, the not only in Britain, also in the European Court, there's been uh, some decisions that say, you know, these firms have to be seen as belonging to the sector in which they they're located. Um, but what what these firms are doing, they're saying, and U Uber, the taxi firm, are the same. They say we are not part. Uber say we do not provide taxi services, so we're not governed by any law that governs taxi services. Uh, 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 and s similarly, uh, the social media companies like Facebook, they say, we are not publishers. We don't publish material. We're just a platform on which things get written, published. Uh, therefore, the law that governs publishing, the law of libel, for example, law of defamation, doesn't apply to us because we're not publishers. Uh, so the claim is that these firms are platforms and not members of the their internet platforms they're not part of the sector they belong to and gradually law courts are beginning to say oh no you you're active in this sector you actually are part of that sector you're governed by its rules uh and there it, 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 as deliveroo this big delivery firm launched itself on the stock exchange in london last week and they expected to be sold for a very large number amount of money but it failed as a disaster and that's because investors fear that this pri legally privileged status of platform firms is about to end that, that gradually the law courts are coming to grips with them um so right so that that's what this debate is about um and it's part of this general wider debate about where do platform companies stand now, it's really it's relevant to democracy i suppose in that these are attempts at evading the law um, uh, and uh, I suppose in a post-democratic system, there would be very little challenge to them because the, 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 these firms would be lobbying governments very successfully and they wouldn't be being challenged. Um, and there is a, a famous case in a way of this, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a case with a, a little twist. Australia, 
government of Australia has made a big stand against Facebook and the other social media companies. Now, these companies use material from newspapers and, and, and television news. They, 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 use, they, they feed on the ordinary newspapers world and use its material, and they don't pay anything for it. Uh, because they say, well, we're, we're just a platform. We, we, we're not governed by these laws. And the Australian government is saying, uh, no, you must pay. And we're not going to let you operate in Australia unless you pay the print newspaper firms for using their material. And this has been seen as a big victory for democracy over, um, uh, uh, over the social media giants. But why is this happening in Australia? Uh, the main owner of virtually all big newspapers in Australia is Rupert Murdoch, who of course also is the major newspaper owner in the United States and in Britain. Also the man who owns Fox News. He's the biggest, he's the biggest media owner in the entire world and he is an Australian. Uh, and so is this a victory of democracy over uh, Facebook or is it a victory of Rupert Murdoch's empire over the Facebook empire? Is it just uh, pure post-democratic politics of a struggle between two different post-democratic forces? Thank you. And uh, our next question comes from Andrei Velchev, who is from Plovdiv University. Hello, Professor Crunch. Great admiration for your books and work. I'm a great, great fan. So you have a fan here. Uh, can you tell me what is the future of e-democracy? Yeah, because e-democracy is the use of the internet uh, for um, for decision making and so forth. And uh, yeah, it clearly it, it, this is one of those ways in which the internet does open up all sorts of possibilities uh, for us to participate. Um, it's just more channels that are open. Now, there's a problem, of course, in that uh, poor people tend not to have access to the internet. And so um, the more things go onto the internet, then the more relatively poor people are excluded. And, and to be outside that, the internet world, you, you, you don't have to be very poor. Uh, so for example, if you take uh, Estonia, a country which has put nearly all of its public business uh, onto the internet. So it's almost impossible to act as a citizen getting forms and things that you need in Estonia without using the internet. And because there is an issue there for, means the poor of Estonia, who there's quite a lot, um, are excluded. And now that you, you can compensate for that by having um, public access points in libraries for, for the internet. Um, and as you get to younger generations, you find that even if they are quite poor, they, they manage to get mobile phones. Um, so there is a problem of inequality with e-democracy, but otherwise, yeah, it opens up more channels that people can use, uh, it, it, more ways in which governments and citizens can communicate with each other. It, it can be very helpful. Mm. Uh, we left uh, uh, two more questions uh, from our participants, and uh, with that we will close uh, our... <coughs> our session. So, uh, the first question comes from uh, Martin Nakov. Uh, what do you think about the concept where people will, with higher level of education should uh, have greater voting rights compared to others? Uh, well, the problem there is that uh, people with higher levels of education tend to be rather wealthier than people without it. And they will obviously use their uh, their greater world, their greater political power to get privileges for, for wealthy people. And so it seems attractive at first because obviously the more educated you are, the more competent you are at democracy. But you also have interests that aren't necessarily general interests. So I suspect they would vote for for lower taxes uh, because they tend to have higher earnings. So I think we we can't we can't risk that. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the last questions come uh, uh, come from Rossi Tenchiva. Dear Professor Crouch, uh, at the 
height of the crisis over Catalonia sessions drive last year, thousands of companies moved their legal headquarters out of the region. The Madrid stock market and government bonds took a hit and the Spanish state came under strong pressure. And all of that happens because the illegal referendum on independence for Catalonia. However, we know that the situation remains tense and could flare up, fly, fire up any time. What is the danger for the economy? Right, yes. The, um, this is a... I don't know if you, I don't think you have issues in Bulgaria like this, do you? Of where there are regions of the country that have particular histories that make them feel they are separate and that they would actually like to leave, please, and form their own new nation state. Uh, we have it in Britain with Scotland. Um, uh, it's important in Belgium, where the country is all hardly holds together as one country. Um, because there's divisions between French speakers and Dutch speakers. And it, Spain has it uh, not only in Catalonia, but also in the Basque country. Uh, it's a particularly big issue for Spain because Catalonia is by far the richest part of Spain. Uh, and a, um, a separate Catalonian state, which, which, which has its own rich history, it's got its own language actually as well, um, would actually take away most of the wealth of Spain and the rest of Spain would be a rather poor country. So it's actually a bigger issue from Spain than the issue of Scotland is for Britain, where Britain could lose Scotland and uh, it, it, it would not be poorer because of it. So Catalonia is a very particular case, really. Um, well, actually, yeah, and it's also, it's also the, in Belgium it is the case because the the majority there it's the majority part of the country the dutch speakers who actually are now the wealthier part of the country that would many of them would like to leave and that would leave the french speaking part of the country as a rather poor remainder so uh, there was there's also been a movement in italy to create a north of the country that would separate itself um that had that would also be a separation of the richest part of the country from the rest and would therefore be very dangerous the problem the northern separatists in italy had is that they don't have a history of that region it, they tried to invent a region they drew a line around the richest part of the country said right that's us uh, but whereas catalonia scotland uh, flanders have deep histories uh, this didn't and so eventually the party turned itself into a national party and instead of hating Southern Italians, started to hate Muslims instead, since when they've been very successful. So uh, a lot depends, on, uh, as the questioner is implying, on, on the, the relative uh, wealth of the part that wants to defend. And if it is the wealthier part, as in Catalonia, then it, 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 oh, you can see why the rest of the country fights. Um, the problem is, if people really do want to separate, and there really is a majority wants to do that, is it possible to resist them? Um, outside Europe, there's also the issue in Canada of Quebec, the French-speaking speaking part of Quebec. But there's now a compromise around that. But in the past, they wanted to separate. So you often get this. Um, the, the problem is, in a way, people should have a right every now, every few years to vote on these things if, if popular feeling gets really strong on it. Uh, where the Catalonians made a very big mistake was they, 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 they didn't tr try to get the agreement of the Spanish government. They, they went ahead, uh, ahead and did it without that. So the Spanish government was able to define it as an illegal act. Uh, they went really over the top then and have seen it as a kind of act of treason and have locked up the Catalan leaders in prison with long sentences. So Spain has clearly mismanaged this whole thing. Um, it's, it can only proceed really, unless you're willing to have violence, it can only proceed by an agreement between the two sides. Yes, you can have a vote on whether you want to separate or not. Um, uh, otherwise, it, it, it can't be achieved. And uh, I see a raised hand from the lady, uh, which... <laughs> Yeah, Hello. Sorry, this is Final Matthew. 
this is Juliet. I'm sorry it says Matthew on the screen. I have no idea. This is my husband's name. No idea how it came up, but <laughs> Juliet. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, it was very uh, insightful. And I have a question regarding um, actually the pandemic, going back to the pandemic a little bit more. Um, how do you think the pandemic has influenced populism? The reason why I'm asking is because the pandemic has revealed a lot of crisis now, health crisis, economic crisis. And people, as you said, are getting more engaged, becoming more engaged, more alert on what's of what's happening in their country, but at the same time in other countries. Now, by logically, if you have lots of crisis, I mean, usually populists have thrived in crisis and they've enjoyed them so much and they've used them to blame the governments, blame the elites, blame globalization as well. Now, but this is different and it's different because you, these crises require decisions and they require experts and they require knowledge. Now, do you think that populists, now we've come to the era of like experts, technocrats, people who know what they're talking about. Um, Basically, how did how does the pandemic uh, how did the pandemic influence populism? It's a good question, and, and the answer is that it's it's been very varied, mm -hmm. and it depends on how the populists themselves have seen the crisis. Uh, those who have accepted that there is a health crisis here that requires drastic measures, and have willing be, and have said yes we must take strong action against virus. They have tended to remain very popular, to grow in popularity. Mm -hmm. uh, but several of them have followed the sort of new American libertarian form of populism that says all government controls, especially those led by experts, are bad. They have actually been punished by public opinion. And so Salvini's uh, Lega movement in Italy, they, they followed that line and they suffered in public opinion that they've gone down instead uh, uh the old fascist party which said yes we must take strong controls uh, they've come up in popularity so in italy uh, the libertarian wing of the populace went down the old fascist wing went up uh, uh, donald trump of course uh, was a denier of the importance of the crisis for a long while it, it, it he suffered and at the moment bolsonaro in Brazil, who completely denies the existence of the crisis, he is becoming extremely unpopular because uh, he has the misfortune of actually being in government. Um, but in, in general, it depends on the line the part the populist parties have taken, and if those who, given that most publics around the world at the moment are very worried about this virus, they say we, we've got to take strict action. We've got to be very careful. Uh, Populist movements that have contradicted that and have said, oh, this is a load of nonsense, they have been punished by populists. So it's very interesting that, that, that uh, it's certainly to the extent that libertarianism is part of the new populist movements, then they've tended to suffer. Mm -hmm. And they have. Uh, and the very last questions comes from uh, Vasil Smiriski. Vasil, please. Uh, uh, hello, uh, hello, Professor Crouch. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, referendums? And do you think that they're of significant importance for democratic societies? I'm asking specifically because a couple of years ago in Bulgaria there was a huge discussion, discussion about whether or not to build a new nuclear power plant. And uh, a lot of people suggest, suggested that the government uh, should conduct uh, a national referendum. However, a lot of our other people were against that, and their argument was uh, that most of the Bulgarian citizens are obviously not nuclear physicists, so they should not have uh, opinions on such matters. Yeah, obviously, referenda are a form of direct democracy. Um, re referenda work best when an issue is very simple uh, where you don't need a lot of knowledge in order to have an opinion and where uh, there is not a major bias in the opinions of powerful and rich people because a, a problem with referendum well, the first problem with referendums is we do need to understand what it's about we need to understand a particular issue uh, 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 
which is a difficult thing to do for all of us. Um, if it's a very simple issue where you don't need a lot of knowledge, then yeah, we can make, we can have views and have decisions. The second point, uh, if there is a big bias in the standpoint of very powerful and rich people, uh, they will uh, use media campaigns very heavily to influence the referendum results. If opinion among them is, is more balanced so that they're on both sides, then you might find that you actually get the conditions for a, a decent decision. So yeah, referenda have a place, but they do. there are these two conditions, I think. One, simplicity, uh, and no major bias in very powerful interests. They're, 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 they're best on local issues, actually, uh, rather than, than big national themes. Thank you very much uh, again, uh, Professor Crouch. And uh, with that, I want to, to close this, uh, this event. Uh, thank you very much again, Professor. Uh, it, for us, it was a great pleasure and great honor to share your time with us and to share this, all this experience. I think it was very fruitful and very interesting meeting. So once again, uh, thanks from behalf of uh, the, of Wuzofa University and director and uh, I, at the very very end I want to mention that uh, to happen this event uh, the biggest effort was made from Professor Durankev and I want, I want to, to thank him he was too shy to to talk now but uh, still I want to to thank him for, for all the effort that he makes to to happen this meeting Thank you all. Thank you all the participants. It was a great pleasure to have you here. And have, stay healthy. <laughs> thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for being willing to listen to a foreign language for such a long period. I, I, I often do this myself and I know how it's very tiring. So you all need a big rest now. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you.